Empathy. It's something we all appreciate, but it's not always easy to get. I think the same applies to filmmaking and the director's ability to draw out an emotional response from the audience. Today I'm going to be talking about creating empathy and an understanding with the subjects of a documentary and how an audience's reaction to those feelings can muster up a call to arms. I'm going to be focusing on the 2008 true crime documentary, Dear Zachary, A Letter to His Son About His Father. I'm an only child, and I'll get around to why this is of any importance whatsoever, but <laughs> trust me, there's a theme. Now to fully understand the cinematic and editing choices made by the director, it's important to give you a quick summary of the documentary. Dear Zachary started off as a film to memorialize Andrew Bagby, a young man who was murdered in 2001. The director, Kurt Quain, was a dear friend of Andrew's and planned to screen the film exclusively to family and close friends. But once filming began, news broke out that Shirley Temple, a woman who Andrew was seeing before his death, was pregnant with his son. It was some kind of wondrous news for Andrew's parents, David and Kathleen, knowing that there was a part of their son that would live on and remind them of Andrew. There was just one problem. Their son's killer just happened to also be the mother of his child. In 1999, after a failed engagement and during his third year in medical school, Andrew began dating Shirley Turner, a medical intern and a woman 12 years his senior. Although medical school saw them living in different states, they still maintained a long-distance relationship. When together, Andrew's friends were unsure of her. She was crude and had obsessive behaviors, and just generally did not seem suited for him. Nobody said anything because we all respected Andrew. And if he wasn't putting the pieces together or something, it just makes me think he was just not caring. In 2001, Andrew quit surgical residency and transferred to a family practice in Pennsylvania. His move found him success and stability, and Andrew decided this was the perfect time to end his relationship with Shirley. After a visit from Shirley, Andrew saw her off on a flight back to Iowa, almost a thousand miles away where she was living at the time. At 5.30 a.m. the next day, after driving the entire journey back overnight, Shirley ended up on Andrew's doorstep demanding to talk. Agreeing to meet after work, Andrew told one of his colleagues about the situation and that he'd call him at 7.30 once he had finished talking to Shirley. Andrew never ended up calling. His body was found the next day, shot five times. It would be nice if the story stopped there. If the pinnacle of anguish felt by David and Kathleen and the rest of Andrew's loved ones came to an end with his passing. But they weren't so lucky. The next few years proved to be some of the toughest that involved Shirley fleeing to St. John's, Newfoundland to avoid extradition, finding out she was carrying Andrew's unborn son, Zachary, spending their life savings and trying to claim sole custody of the child, seeing Shirley get locked up for the murder of their son, getting custody of Zachary, only to watch her be released by a judge due to her not posing as a, and I quote, threat to society. It was only a few months later, on August 18th of 2003, that Shirley and Zachary were found dead after jumping into the Atlantic Ocean as a murder-suicide. What started off as a tribute to a best friend and an incredible son ended up being a documentary of one of the most twisted acts of human cruelty. So why did Kurt Quain make Dear Zachary? Why didn't he stop his friend's memoir after finding out about Zachary's passing? Was he simply trying to make money off of a disgustingly sick yet captivating story? Dear Zachary is a testament to the profound and real effects that documentary filmmaking can make. Quinn used this story to create a call to arms with the flawed legal system in Canada and hoped to create a change in the legislation. While only a handful of individuals were sincerely affected and had to live through the tragedy, Quinn knew that they weren't the only ones impacted by an unfair child welfare system. But sitting on a couch feeling sorry for someone is different than truly caring and doing something about it. Because of that, Quinn knew he couldn't just simply present the facts as they were. While those of you watching this video journal are privy to much of the same facts stated in the full documentary, my telling of the events has nowhere near the same emotional impact. Quinn employs a series of documentary techniques that give the true crime film a reason to be taken seriously. Narrative editing, testimonials, and the voice of God. While simple and familiar to the documentary genre, these main devices Quinn used were done in such a deliberate way that he was able to get a bill regarding the safety of children in custody disputes to be passed in Parliament just two years after the documentary was released. While considered controversial to the capturing of honest truth in documentary filmmaking, narrative editing allows the filmmaker to engage the audience and explore the story as they see it. Dear Zachary follows the same storyline that Quinn went through when filming his original plan. It starts off with emotional and touching interviews from friends, clips of Andrew as a child, and bittersweet smiles on the faces of those talking as they recount all the happy memories they shared with him. But as the documentary unfolds and more is added to the story, the more Quinn harshly edits the footage. Jump cuts, overlapping audio, and jarring color correction adds to the emotion behind the story. Quinn stated that he edited the film to react the same way that those going through these events reacted in real time. No one knew Shirley was pregnant, everyone was left guessing what would happen to her trial, and the shocking edit when we found out about Zachary's death is trying to capture, regardless of the magnitude of the situation, 
the same shock that David and Kathleen experienced when hearing the news. I'm to do this as a surprise for you and David. Fury, no question. Kill him. Strangle that fucking bitch right here, right now. Fury, no question. Kill him. Dear Zachary is edited like a non-fiction story, keeping the audience guessing about what tragic event might happen to the seemingly lovely family. But the film itself has the look of a home video. I believe that's one of its strongest aspects, because while the audience may not know Andrew or Zachary personally, they certainly know someone just like him. Son, daughter, niece, or nephew, many of us have footage of loved ones as innocent youth, without a care about the reality around them. This in turn creates a connection with the audience, realizing that this could happen to anyone. Can I say things that are not like completely right. flattering and wonderful? The second tool Quinn utilizes, and is scattered throughout the film, is the use of personal testimonies. He had the capacity to have the worst possible gas. He'd be proud of that, yep. He wasn't yeah. a saint. He was a hell of a guy. He was just so intelligent. And, um... <laughs> Makes sense, considering he was planning to get all of Andrew's closest friends to speak on his character. But once tragedy strikes, Quinn uses these interviews to linger on emotions, allowing the subjects to freely talk until the subject matter gets too much for them. And they simply just snap. <laughs> this is what that fucking bitch didn't know. To be able to get a glimpse inside the raw emotions of those involved creates a shocking response for the audience. It almost seems too personal to be invited into the life of someone who's experienced such a profound and personal loss. To be able to evoke those kind of feelings from an audience member takes it one step closer to increase the chance that the audience would become actively involved in the issue. Similar to those who have taken an interest in topics such as gun violence from watching Bowling for Columbine, or have become vocal about animal treatment from watching The Cove. Finally, it's hard to shy away from Quain's overpowering voice of God. Used heavily in expository documentary, Quain takes it to another level as it seems more robotic than human. While your grandparents and Jackie battled surely for more time with you in family court, the law and the extradition proceedings was still slow. September 19th, the extradition hearing finally began and evidence was finally presented. But just as everything was moving along smoothly, Shirley's lawyer Randy Piercy threw a wrench into the works. Because the authority to proceed with these hearings provided by the Minister of Justice early that year had failed to specify subsections 1 or or two of section 229a of the criminal code the authority to proceed was invalid the 90-day limit to amend it was now passed and therefore all extradition proceedings against Shirley should be dropped so she could get on with her life Oof. and that's just 30 seconds Quinn uses such an incredibly monotone voice coupled with his fast talking and absolute certainty in what he's saying that the audience never has time to mull over what he's actually said to him it's the absolute truth with no bias attached simply just stating facts while that may be true it is his delivery that seals the deal not only does he tell the viewer what we should know, keeping out any other details that may harm his case, he also includes background noises to support the narrative. In the previous clip when talking about Shirley's extradition being dropped, the music tempo increases, a metronome is heard, and the viewer suddenly feels boxed in with nowhere to go, much like David and Kathleen felt about their limited choice of actions. Especially considering the fact that the objective of this documentary is to change laws, Queen finds himself needing to appear as neutral as possible. He pays close attention when to actually include himself into the film, appearing only in scattered moments and without drawing much attention to himself. He chooses to instead highlight the relationships that everyone else had with Andrew. Doing so creates an even greater sense of emotional detachment, allowing Quain to come across as an unbiased source on the topic, regardless of the fact that he considers himself to be one of Andrew's best friends. Every film and documentary is made with a purpose. Some are to entertain, others are to see just how much that filmmaker can push the boundaries of their abilities, and some are created to leave an impact. In an ideal world, none of us would have seen Dear Zachary. It would have been left as a memory to his son about the incredible person his father was. Unfortunately, the legal system failed that son, and saw his life being taken by an individual they let walk free and have custody over him after being the prime suspect in a murder. Quinn employed a number of choices in his film to create as much of an emotional response as possible to create change, and it worked. In 2012, Bill 464, also known as Zachary's Bill, was passed in Parliament with the goal to keep children safe who were involved with an individual charged with a serious crime. Quain took a home video and used it to make that possible.